Please be seated. Lent is traditionally a season for confession, so I thought I'd start this morning by admitting one of my own weaknesses. That got your attention, didn't it? I wouldn't exactly put it in the category of deepest, darkest sins, but ever since watching the late Bill Bixby in the popular TV series of the same name in the 1970s and 80s, I've had a certain fascination with the Incredible Hulk. Oh dear, I've got a bit of speaker noise going on here. And why has this uh, story of a guy transformed by anger into a far from jolly green giant so intrigued me? What led me to indulge this interest by spending hard-earned cash renting the movie version of The Hulk some years back? Apart from my own warped sense of humour, what may grab me most, I suspect, is a much bigger concern that we all share about anger and its destructive power. We find a similar theme in Robert Louis Stevenson's famous novel, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, if you think about it. There, the otherwise quite respectable physician has to drink a special potion to become the crazy and violent Mr. Hyde. But what emerges when he does, of course, is a darker, much angrier self. And let's face it, we can all struggle with the question of anger, can't we? We can even get angry with speakers on a Sunday morning. <laughs> We know that anger can be a very present reality in our relationships and that it can be a negative force. So we can even end up wondering whether there's any real place at all for the healthy expression of anger in the Christian life. And the struggle only increases when we think about God. If we're honest, most of us prefer the idea of a loving God who forgives human wrongdoing than of a just God who also condemns or even punishes it. That's why the example of Jesus is so crucial and this morning's Gospel takes us right to the heart of the issue in John's controversial account of the clearing of the Jerusalem temple. I sometimes think that we are tempted to reduce the story of Jesus in the Jerusalem temple to a kind of Jekyll and Hyde situation. There we have Jesus, whom we usually think of in very peaceable terms, perhaps as gentle Jesus, meek and mild, in the famous words of Charles Wesley's hymn. And what's he doing? Verses 13 through 16 tell us that when he discovers a sprawling combination of an animal market come bank in the temple courts, he becomes so agitated that he makes a whip out of cords and drives all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. Then he scatters the coins of the money changers and overturns their tables. And he says to those selling doves for temple sacrifices, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Now the setting for Jesus' action 
may give him very good reason to do what he does. It's almost Passover, one of the holiest seasons in the Jewish religious year. And he's visiting the temple that God was supposed to inhabit in person, according to Old Testament tradition. Jesus is in what he calls his father's house. And what he finds there is more of a market than a place of worship. So he's understandably upset. Imagine this sanctuary turned into a store. Or perhaps the whole of the tri-church building redeveloped into a mall. And I'm sure that there are more than one or two local contractors who would be happy to help do that for us. And we may begin to imagine and get a sense of Jesus' outrage. He's so perturbed, verse 17 tells us, that zeal or passion for God's house is moving or quite literally consuming him. And we can surely see why. But even when we understand the setting, we can still find Jesus' behaviour rather shocking, can't we? We just don't like to think of him being angry, still less acting on that and using what amounts to violence to make his point. So what's the problem? Well, part of it, I think, stems from a simple misunderstanding about anger. We will all get angry from time to time. And biblical teaching is clear that there are occasions when anger is justified. The problem is with what we might call prolonged personal animosity and with resentment and bitterness, which the Bible clearly teaches are negative behavior patterns. The Apostle Paul's warning in Ephesians 4 verses 26 to 7 is one of the clearest pieces of teachings on this subject in the context of personal relationships. In your anger do not sin, he says, quoting directly from Psalm 4 verse 4. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. The implication here is that getting angry with one another is not necessarily sinful in and of itself. The key question is what we do with our anger and especially whether we indulge it rather than resolving or releasing it. Some of us have probably heard the famous saying that resentment is like drinking poison and hoping it will kill someone else. But bearing grudges and nursing bitterness don't really do anyone any good, do they? So instead of staying angry with each other, the Apostle calls his readers to deal with their differences quickly and effectively. In other words, to seek and find reconciliation as soon as possible. In fact, there's really only one area where there seems a place, a biblical place, for sustained agitation, and that's in the case of just or righteous indignation against evil and its consequences. We should never forget that God is full of compassion and mercy for everyone, according to James 5.11, including those who turn away from God. So Exodus 34, 6 tells us that God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. But we can also find many examples of God's holy anger against sin and injustice, and not just in the Old Testament. And the New Testament is very clear in passages like Ephesians 5, 6, that God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient, while Paul warns plainly in Romans 2.8 that for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Now, we may not like to think of God in those terms, of course, but what could we really 
call God good or just if God wasn't concerned about such things and since Jesus is the Son of God we should surely expect him to share that concern just as he shows when he clears out the temple in our gospel reading and that's how I personally account for the events in John 2 as an example of Jesus just and righteous indignation in action you may not share my view but if you don't I would still suggest that you try asking yourself how you think that God ought to feel about the kind of activity that Jesus saw in that Jerusalem temple is God happy with injustice and exploitation does God approve the violence of unjust war for example or the effects of pollution or poverty is God willing to turn a blind eye to the abuse and exploitation of women and children does God condone racism or unfair employment practices or sexism or pornography or similar evils I think not and that's precisely what we find with Jesus so a helpful way of understanding the clearing of the temple is as a living object lesson of Jesus righteous indignation in action it also represents I believe and a clear example of the healthy expression of what we might call a prophetic action against sin and injustice which the church is called to share Christ's prophetic ministry is very much in evidence in the last five verses of our gospel where he talks about the temple of his body and predicts his own resurrection but Jesus role as prophet extends far beyond prediction of the future it also involves declaring God's truth and denouncing injustice declaring God's truth and denouncing injustice in Luke 4 verses 18 to 19 when speaking at his home synagogue in Nazareth Jesus clearly declares the truth that he's come to share the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor scholars have argued over the exact application of these verses but the safest way to read them I think is an inclusive one so the poor include both the materially lacking and those who are spiritually and emotionally so as well the prisoners are both people in physical incarceration and those who are held captive in other ways by evil and all its negative consequences the blind are all who cannot see the truth as well as those who cannot see at all and the heart of Jesus message in these verses centers on the marvelous revelation that he has come to be and bring good news for such people and many many more to those struggling with guilt and personal alienation he offers forgiveness and reconciliation to all wrestling with addictions and negative behavior patterns he can bring freedom and release for those who are diseased in mind body or soul he promises healing and wholeness if not in this life then in the world to come to all who are oppressed or marginalized he speaks liberation and justice to those who are lonely or anxious he draws near with God's presence and comfort in all these ways and so many others Jesus was and is a prophet he comes declaring God's truth and what a wonderful truth that is at the same time a second key feature of Jesus ministry as prophet is that he's totally unafraid 
to denounce or speak out against injustice. We can be so careful with our use of language nowadays that it's almost become absurd. I'm as much in favor of trying to avoid people, um, offending people unnecessarily as the next person. But I came across a list online that gave some interesting, if mostly fictitious examples of possible access. How about the phrase aquatically challenged for drowning? Or perhaps biologically challenged for dead? Then there was chronologically gifted for old. And if you're interested in knowing what a client of the correctional system is, it's a prisoner. A differently brained person is stupid. And a factually unencumbered individual is ignorant. If you're monetarily challenged, you're poor. And if ethically challenged, a crook. Last but not least, a sexually focused, chronologically gifted individual is a dirty old man. <laughs> and the absolute root of all evil known in the multi-dimensional infinity of reality is ultimately, of course, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male like me. But joking aside, the language that Jesus uses to describe the sins and sinners of his day is often far from politically correct. When we read the Gospels, we find him deliberately crossing class and gender and race and religious barriers as he reaches out with fear or favor to all who will come to him. But Jesus has little time for pride or hypocrisy of any kind. We hear that in verse 16 of our Gospel, where he denounces those selling doves for sacrificial offerings. And I could list many similar examples. And Jesus says all this with the absolute authority of the living Son of God who's come to live and suffer and die and rise again for our sake. We obviously don't enjoy the same unique status, of course. But if our gospel reminds us of it, us anything this morning, it's surely that we're all called to an active engagement with our world, just as Jesus was. We're not asked to reject society or look down on it from afar. Nor are we expected to compromise and hide who we are. No, Christians are to be right in the thick of things. We're to be sought and light. We are to declare God's truth and denounce injustice, not just through what we say, but through what we do, as we think and pray, speak and work for a better world. So when Jesus makes people his disciples, he doesn't just ask us to go to church on Sunday or clean up our personal lives. He invites us to follow his prophetic example and to live out our faith by witnessing to God's truth and striving for justice. He calls us, in fact, to the kind of radical, inspiring life that he lived as we seek social as well as personal change and we directly challenge the values of our society when necessary. We may not be in the temple in Jerusalem, but we are in many other places. And wherever we are, we have a part to play and a message to deliver. I don't know about you, but I find that a very challenging, a very exciting vision. And as I draw to a close, I'd like to live that with you. Let's bow our heads. Loving God, we thank you for your word and for its ability to challenge us as well as to guide and direct us. To make us think again about what it means 
to be true followers of Jesus, not just in our personal lives, but in our everyday lives, in our vocational lives, wherever you call us to be. And we are also sometimes asked to follow his prophetic example, to declare your truth and to call things as you see them. Give us greater understanding, Lord. Give us ever greater sensitivity so that we might share your good news with the world and bring others to know you. In Jesus' name, Amen.